There are two main energy storage solutions for electric vehicles, batteries and hydrogen fuel cells. Both can be said to store energy in the form of chemical energy. While neither batteries nor fuel cells store electrical energy, both batteries and fuel cells can release electrical energy, or electricity, which can be used to power an electric motor. However, unlike the battery, which stores chemical energy in the form of metallic compounds and converts that chemical energy to electrical energy, which is then released from the battery, strictly the fuel cell does not actually store energy. Instead, it is just an energy conversion device. It converts chemical energy in the form of hydrogen, which is stored separately from the fuel cell, into electrical energy, which is then released from the fuel cell. The fuel cell, therefore, has to be fed with an external supply of hydrogen. By the way, you can learn exactly how batteries work in our separate video on batteries. Link in the description below. So how does the fuel cell convert hydrogen into electricity? Let's open up a fuel cell and find out. The fuel cell consists of several key components. Firstly, two end plates, which are usually fabricated from titanium alloy for its low weight, corrosion resistance and impermeability to hydrogen. The end plates are shaped with channels which will direct reactants and reaction products. The channels are filled with sintered titanium particles, which act as gas distributors for reactants and reaction products. An electrolyte is placed between the two end plates. The most common type of electrolyte is a permeable, solid-state, polymer-based electrolyte called a polymer electrolyte membrane, PEM. The PEM is typically fabricated from a sulfonated, tetrafluoroethylene-based polymer with thickness of 0.2mm. The PEM is coated with a very thin layer of electrocatalyst on each side. Each side is just 5 to 30 microns in thickness. These layers consist of nanoparticles, deposited by particle vapour deposition, or more recently, chemical vapour deposition, in order to achieve porosity and thus permeability to reactants and reaction products. Typically, a platinum cobalt alloy is used. Each electrocatalyst is coated with a layer of current collector, around 0.1mm in thickness. Again, the current collector layers consist of deposited particles in order to achieve porosity and thus permeability. Copper, aluminium and more recently graphene are typically used for the current collectors. The current collectors are connected by a conductive wire, again typically copper, to create a path for an electric circuit. That completes the structure of the fuel cell, with all of its key components in place. In reality, the end plates sit tight against the current collectors, but let's open the cell up again so we can see what's happening inside. Oxygen gas, which can be plain simple atmospheric air, is pumped into one side of the fuel cell via the porous, sintered, titanium-filled channels in the end plates. The oxygen, or air, is compressed before pumping into the cell to increase its pressure and density, and thereby increase the rate of the electrochemical reaction that will follow shortly inside the fuel cell. Simultaneously, compressed hydrogen gas is pumped into the other side of the fuel cell. When the H2 hydrogen molecule, consisting of two hydrogen atoms, contacts the electrocatalyst, the hydrogen molecule is split into its two separate hydrogen atoms. Each hydrogen atom is then split to form a positively charged hydrogen cation and a negatively charged free electron. We call this the oxidation half reaction, and we call the site or electrode where this happens the anode. A hydrogen atom has just one electron. It needs one more electron to obtain a complete outer shell. This is why hydrogen atoms spontaneously form H2 molecules, composed of two hydrogen atoms in a covalent bond in which they share each other's one electron to obtain the complete outer shell. However, the electrocatalyst has split the hydrogen molecule into two separate hydrogen atoms. The hydrogen atoms are not very happy about this, since they want to share each other's one electron so to achieve the complete outer shell. But the electrocatalyst won't let this happen. So each hydrogen atom takes matters into its own hands and dumps its own electron to have no electrons at all, which is the next best thing to a complete outer shell. The hydrogen cations want to migrate over to the other side of the fuel cell due to the concentration gradient, flowing from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. Fortunately, the PEM is permeable to hydrogen cations, so their wish is granted. However, the PEM is impermeable to the free electrons, and so blocks them. 
the free electrons are therefore left behind on the conductive current collector. The negatively charged free electrons are attracted to the other side of the fuel cell by the attraction of the positively and therefore oppositely charged hydrogen cations which are now over there, but the free electrons are blocked by the PEM. However, this is where the conductive wire connecting the current collectors comes into play. The free electrons can get over to the other side of the fuel cell via this route. This flow of electrons is our source of an electric current and thus can be used to power an electrical device such as a DC motor. As the hydrogen cations and free electrons reunite, they reform the two hydrogen atoms, which then reform the H2 hydrogen molecule. Simultaneously, an oxygen atom, which remember is sitting in the channels of the end plate, combines with the H2 hydrogen molecule to form a water molecule, H2O, in which each hydrogen atom shares its electron with the oxygen atom to give the oxygen atom a complete outer shell, and in return, the oxygen atom shares one electron with each hydrogen atom to give each hydrogen atom a complete outer shell. We call this reaction between the hydrogen cations, the free electrons and the oxygen atom the reduction half reaction, and we call the site or electrode where this happens the cathode. Although this reaction will happen spontaneously, the electrocatalyst accelerates it. The water is purged from the cell as a waste product. Strictly, the electrode that is the site of the oxidation half reaction, where hydrogen atoms oxidized into hydrogen cations and free electrons, is called the anode. Meanwhile, the electrode that is the site of the reduction half reaction, where hydrogen cations and the oxygen atom are reduced by free electrons to form water, is called the cathode. However, an interesting fact about the hydrogen fuel cell is that it is essentially a water electrolyzer cell used for generating hydrogen from water and electricity that operates in reverse. In the electrolyzer cell, the anode and its oxidation half reaction is on the oxygen side of the cell, while the cathode and its reduction half reaction is on the hydrogen side of the cell. Convention dictates that this placement of anode and cathode terms remains the same in the fuel cell. Thus, in the fuel cell, the electrode on the hydrogen side is often but incorrectly known as the cathode, while the electrode on the oxygen side is often but incorrectly known as the anode. The cathode constitutes the positive terminal of the fuel cell, while the anode constitutes the negative terminal of the fuel cell. The oxidation half reaction has a zero cell potential, which indicates that it occurs spontaneously upon activation by the electrocatalyst, and that it doesn't need any input voltage to make it happen. The reduction half reaction has a positive cell potential of plus 1.23 volts, which indicates the maximum theoretical voltage that will be generated, that is from the flow of electrons, as this half reaction happens, although in practice the voltage is lower than this at just 0.6 or 0.8 volts at most with the latest, most efficient fuel cells. This cell potential of 0.8 volts is where the nominal voltage of the hydrogen fuel cell comes from. The loss of voltage from the maximum theoretical value of 1.23 volts is mainly due to loss of electrical energy as heat. So that's how a hydrogen fuel cell works. 0.8 volts isn't going to be much use for powering an electric vehicle. So multiple fuel cells are stacked together to produce a fuel cell stack with higher voltage. Here we have a stack of 5 cells. But to make the stack work as one, and thereby get higher voltages out of it, we need to make some adjustments. Firstly, the end plates of each cell in the interior of the stack are removed, so to leave behind just one end plate at each end of the stack. These then become known as the stack end plates. The anode current collector from all cells, bar the final cell in the stack, is removed. The anode electrocatalyst from all cells, bar the final cell in the stack, is also removed. The cells are then wired together in series. Notice how the cathode from each cell joins the series and then bypasses the anode, with the series terminating at the anode of the final cell in the stack. A bipolar plate is slotted in between adjacent cells, that is between the anode of the previous cell and the cathode of the next cell. This is why it is called a bipolar plate. The first job of the bipolar plates is exactly the same as the first end plate, that is to deliver hydrogen molecules to the cathode. The second job of the bipolar plates is to allow hydrogen cations at the anode of the previous cell to pass through to the cathode of the next cell. Hydrogen cations accumulate along the stack. 
Note the hydrogen cations are not reduced to hydrogen atoms as they make their way along the stack. This is because there are no free electrons present to reduce them, with the free electrons bypassed to the final cell in the stack. This is necessary to achieve the accumulated series voltage. All of the hydrogen cations and all of the free electrons liberated from the cathode of each cell all collect at the anode of the final cell in the stack, which is where the hydrogen cations will be reduced to hydrogen atoms and in turn bond with oxygen atoms to yield water molecules. Hence, this is also where oxygen is pumped in, and water is purged from the final cell in the stack. Since each cell generates quite a bit of heat, a cooling plate, which is an air-to-water intercooler, is added to each cell. The cooling plates are perforated to allow hydrogen cations to pass through. This is our complete stack, with all the cells brought together. Finally, an oxygen inlet sits on one side of the stack, delivering oxygen from the compressor, while a hydrogen inlet sits on the other side, delivering compressed hydrogen from the hydrogen storage tanks.